Good evening and welcome. Uh, my name is Ted Kessick and I'm a professor here at the uh, Daniels faculty and I have the privilege of coordinating this lecture series. The uh, Building Ecology, Science and Technology lecture series here at the John H. Daniels Faculty of Architecture, Landscape and Design is now in its fifth year. On behalf of the Daniels faculty, I wish to extend our sincere appreciation for the generous support provided by Tremco Roofing and Maintenance over the past five years. With, without their support, this event would not be possible. The lecture series is intended to complement the public programming at Daniels by inviting leading researchers and practitioners to share their perspectives on the emerging intersection between ecology, science and technology in the built environment. Each lecture qualifies for two hours of OAA structured learning credits and lecture series themes are coordinated to complement the OAA learning cycles. Those who wish to have a certificate of participation emailed to them are invited to fill in the registration forms and leave them with me or our staff at the end of this uh, lecture. And you can leave them up here at the table as well if that's convenient for you. Uh, before introducing this evening's speaker, I would like to invite Sean McCallum of Tremco to welcome you personally to tonight's lecture. Sean? Thanks, Ted. Um, as Ted alluded to, this is our fifth year being associated with the best lecture series. Uh, and it really is a thrill for us to be associated with this, uh, with this series of lectures. It's um, a phenomenal event, uh, and it's amazing to me, the attendance, how it's grown and grown every year. Uh, seems like the overflow area outside is overflowing, so we're really thrilled to be a part of that. Um, for those of you who don't know us, uh, Tremco Roofing and Building Maintenance is a, a local manufacturer here of premium roofing materials. Um, we're on a variety of sort of high-profile jobs that you may be familiar with uh, in Toronto, just to list a few, uh, the Union Station revitalization, the Pan Am Games site, uh, the Science Centre, the Distillery District, virtually every hospital up and down University Avenue, and this high-profile high building, uh, we're involved with the Grit Lab up here. So essentially, got any, any high-profile important project uh, in building in the city and in the province of Ontario, you know, Tremco is uh, for the most part involved uh, in a roofing capacity. Um, as I said, we're a local manufacturer. We have three manufacturing facilities uh, about 10 minutes up the road here in Leaside. Uh, it's a zero landfill uh, uh, manufacturing facility, which is pretty staggering uh, when you think about how dirty a, a process it is to manufacture roofing materials. Um, we're quite proud of that. So we would invite anyone to come, uh, come on up for a tour of that facility. We'd, I'd be happy to take you uh, out for, uh, for a half an hour or 45 minute tour. So if you are interested, please come and see me afterwards. Um, uh, just uh, one last kind of note uh, about us being associated with this. Uh, it's funny, I, I have two uh, very young children at home, a two and a half year old and a five month old. And uh, my parents sort of live two and a half hours away. My wife's parents live uh, in South America, so we don't have a lot of help at home. So whenever I have to go out of the house for the night, for when it's work related, it's kind of always like the Spanish Inquisition. You know, where are you going? How long are you going to be? When are you coming home? Do you really need to be there? So same thing, you know, we had, we had that conversation tonight. Where are you going? I said, you know, we, it's our lecture series. It's the first one. I want to make sure I'm there. And when are you going to be home later? Uh, she said, do you, do you really need to be there? I said, yeah, of course. I would, you know, I'd love to be there. You know, we'll introduce a speaker. She said, well, what's the topic tonight? And I said, it's about walkability. She said, well, what does that have to do with roofing? And I said, it's <laughs> a good question. But I thought for a second, I really wanted to get out of the house. You know, I'd be trapped in there with two kids. I said, you know, when... Uh, when people design better buildings, they tend to design better roofs. And when they design better roofs, they have a, a real tendency to specify Tremco. So that's kind of how, how I justified it. I got out of the house. Probably going to sleep on the couch tonight, but, you know, I'm, I'm sure it'll all be worthwhile. So anyway, uh, I just want to encourage any, any design professionals out there, uh, you know, when you're out there in the real world, um, if you do have a high-profile project or any project you do care about, I hope you will consider Tremco uh, when, you when it comes to specifying uh, for the roof. So thank you very much, Ted, for the opportunity, and I'm uh, really looking forward to tonight. Thank you. Jennifer Kiesmat is uh, truly a remarkable individual uh, who has taken on the immense challenge of chief planner for the city of Toronto. Uh, she is avidly interested in making Toronto a more livable city and cultivating a culture of excellence in urban planning and design. Among her key objectives is to make Toronto a more walkable city, enhancing the public experience of place 
while so sustaining our health and well-being. The city is for all of us, young and old, rich and poor, healthy and disabled. Jennifer brings a deep passion for inclusiveness and accessibility to the cultural legacy of Toronto's streets through a desire to privilege the pedestrian. It is my pleasure to welcome Jennifer Kismat to the inaugural event of the Best Lecture Series for 2013-14. Well, it's absolutely fabulous to be here today on this day that your new president was installed. I had the great pleasure of being in Convocation Hall earlier today and uh, seeing the pomp and ceremony and uh, the weightiness of the responsibility that your president was taking on. It was a very exciting moment for planners in this city because I believe that we are entering a era where we are going to establish much deeper connections between the university and the city. And we already have wonderful connections, but I believe that our city needs you more than ever, and our city needs our university more than ever, because the challenges that we face as a society, as a city, are becoming more and more complex. And in order to address them in a meaningful way, we need research, data, evidence to inform our decision making and our policy development. So it's a great honor to be here speaking at the University of Toronto. And there's a, uh, all good speakers think really carefully about their audience. And I would like to know my audience a little bit today. Um, throw your hand in the air if you are, um, if you're in architecture school, if that's what you're doing. Throw your hand in the air. Okay, so I'm going to have to do some guessing as to who the rest of you are. <laughs> I'm assuming we have some planners in the room. That would be good to know. Do we, are there some planners in here? Okay, so well, but almost as many uh, uh, architects. Um, tell me some of the other things that you do that you represent in this room today. Throw, yell them out to me. Landscape. Landscape, lawyer. Industrial design. Industrial design, excellent. Some others? Engineering, good. We always want engineers in the room. Builder. A builder, great. We want builders too. Wonderful. We have a wonderful cross-section of city builders in the room today. And I would like to talk to you to what I believe is one of the most important aspects of city building, easily forgotten because it might not seem so, so glamorous. But in fact, it is walking and the importance of integrating walking into our city building. And there's almost no point in going ahead with this conversation about walking if you don't really think walking matters. So I'm going to begin by very briefly just talking a little bit about why walking matters, why you should care about walking if you are a city builder. And one of the key reasons I'd like to propose that walking is not a frivolous activity, is that walking is in fact fundamental to our survival. Yes, I said that. I just said it's fundamental to our survival. So let me unpack that a little bit in the context of some of the reasons why walking is not a frivolous activity. The very first reason is our health. There are very strong and direct correlations between the kinds of communities that we live in and the way we plan our communities and our health. There's wonderful research has been undertaken by this institution linking diabetes rates to built form. And did you know that the proximity you live to a corner store is actually an indicator of whether or not you in fact will uh, uh, be affected by diabetes? There's a direct correlation between built form and our health. We also know that I. Uh, uh, obesity rates are much higher in environments where people do not have access to active forms of transportation, like cycling and walking. So we can correlate the amount we move 
by the way we design our environments. And I'm going to talk about this a little bit more later in, uh, in my presentation, but just as a point of beginning, it's very, very important to know that we can look at the uh, children and walking to school as an indicator of health. A generation ago, most of you probably walked to school. In fact, in 1969, 70% of children in Canada walked to school. Doesn't sound radical, sounds pretty normal. The other 30% were driven or they, or they bust. In just one generation, that number has been inverted. And today, 70% of children are driven to school. Now, interestingly, we can correlate this with obesity in children. We have, in fact, seen a direct increase in obesity in children as children have stopped walking to school. And there's a whole variety of readings, reasons for that, including that children that are driven to school are much less active throughout the entire day. So we know that the communities that we plan have a direct implication on how we move, and how we move has a direct implication on our health. But there's also a not so frivolous reason as to why walking matters, and it has to do with economic development. Did you know that Toronto's most vibrant, economically successful commercial streets depend on high levels of foot traffic, it's pedestrianism that drives economic development on our main streets. 20% of Torontonians choose to walk regularly to do their shopping at destinations within their neighborhoods. This is primarily in the old core of the city where we have a very strong relationship between main streets and the design of our neighborhoods. We also know that uh, pedestrians in fact, spend more, interestingly. There was a study conducted recently in the annex that found that shoppers arriving as pedestrians spent significantly more per month than those that came by car or public transit. Uh, pedestrians, in fact, outspent uh, bicyclists and public transit as well as the car. But interestingly, in second place was the cyclist. Now, anecdotally, you might know this to be true if you cycle in the city, because you might do what I do when I'm cycling home from work. I will very frequently go, oh, I'm just going to pop in here and grab some fresh bread. Or I'm going to pop into the liquor store and buy some wine. I do all of this on my bike, and it's very easy to do. I don't have to park. It only takes a matter, matter of, of minutes. I know that I stop more frequently in the, land, the commercial landscape of the city when I am, in fact, on my bike or walking. There's another very important reason why, why walking is not frivolous, and it has to do with how we use land. Because as we have created communities where we par primarily move around using our cars, we, in fact, consume a tremendous amount of land for vehicles and vehicle parking. And I'll tell you kind of a crazy story. I was working on a project in Regina, and we were doing analysis of the amount of parking that existed in the downtown. And we were also looking at the urban form of the city, which is primarily a, it's a suburban city. And Regina is very unique because it has maintained its office core, unlike many other small-scale cities. But there's a tremendous amount of parking in the downtown. Uh, and we looked at the amount of parking in the downtown, and then we thought, well, all these cars also sit somewhere else in the city overnight. And we, in fact, did a calculation and analysis that discovered that a significant portion of the entire cityscape was covered with parking spots, was covered with parking spots either at home or in the downtown, that, in fact, there was much more land given to parking than there was, in fact, given to housing. It was two to one. And we also see this in places like where we have business parks where there's free parking. Frequently, the amount of space given an office worker is 50% of the space that they have to park their car. We use a tremendous amount of land. And we also know the more obvious implications of things like our fossil fuel consumption that is fundamental uh, a part of driving. So we know that walking, in fact, results in us using our land differently. We plan land differently when we're planning for pedestrians than if we are, in fact, planning for cars. Public health in Toronto estimates that approximately 700, 1,700 people die prematurely each year in Toronto due to smog 
due to our air pollution. This is something we can change. In fact, Portland, Oregon is widely recognized as a very healthy city where people, in fact, choose to cycle. Well, we also know that in 1970, Portland, Oregon was faced with the imposition of a large superhighway, not unlike our Gardner Expressway, that was going to run along the front of the waterfront. And the residents of that city opposed that expressway and, in fact, asked for a, the, the money that was going to be spent on the expressway to instead be spent on investing in cycling infrastructure. People in Portland don't just cycle naturally. It was a very intentional design and plan as part of the infrastructure for how people move about. Well, one of the implications is that Portland, Oregon, over the past 40 years, unlike most North American cities, has seen a dramatic improvement in its air quality and, in fact, a decline in smog. How we move directly impacts our health, not just because we're moving about and burning calories, but also because we're choosing to use different ways of moving that are not having the adverse impacts of fossil fuels, for example. Now, there's one more reason why walking is not a frivolous activity, and I've called this walking and connectedness. And this is really important, particularly in light of some recent research that came uh, out of a community foundation in Vancouver that discovered the relationship between high density communities and a lack of connectedness between people. There's, there's a risk if we're creating high density communities and we're not creating great environments for walking. There is a risk that we're essentially creating vertical suburbs, places where people drive into their building, go up the elevator, get into their unit, come out of the unit, go down the elevator, into the parking garage, and never set foot in the environment or the community in which their building is embedded. This is a risk in part because one of the things that the Community Foundation in Vancouver discovered, to their dismay and shock, was that when rating the different issues facing Vancouver that needed to be addressed, loneliness, in fact, came up as the number one issue facing the city. Not crime, not poverty, it was loneliness. And we need to think very carefully about how we are in a world where we're very easily virtually connected. We're ensuring that we're creating the human contact that we all need and crave in order to thrive. We were very clearly made to walk, and we need to create habitats that are in fact designed for walking. Sitting is of course the counterpoint to walking. It is in fact at the core of modern life. We sit all the time. You're of course sitting right now, but most of you probably sat either in a studio or at a desk all day if you were at work. We also sit for recreation. We watch movies. We watch TV. I'm not telling you anything that you don't already know, but what we do know that that inactivity is in fact coming at a significant and substantial price to our health and to our environment. And I just want to go back for a minute to this link between walking and health, because some of you may have seen a wonderful video by Dr. Mike Evans. It's called 23 and a Half Hours. And in this video, Dr. Mike Evans identifies a magic cure for some of the biggest ailments that we suffer from. He talks about a magic cure that can, in fact, reduce depression by 50%, hypertension by 50%, diabetes by 50%, osteoporosis by 50%, breast cancer by 50%, anxiety by 50%, cardiovascular disease by 50%. The magic cure is walking a half hour a day. That's the magic cure. And he does a wonderful analysis. I encourage you to watch the TED Talk. It's Dr. Mike Evans from, the, from, uh, the, um, he's from one of the hospitals here in Toronto. And he, in fact, demonstrates using control groups and some research and analysis that, in fact, if you have heart disease and you need a stint put in your heart, 
that if you instead take on a therapy of walking for half an hour a day, that two years later your health will be better than if you had in fact had heart surgery. This is dramatic in as much as it's a very, very simple intervention. And in trying to create great cities and in trying to create great places, I want to propose that walking is also a simple intervention that can respond to a whole variety of very real concerns that we have about our cities and our communities, including the stability of our economy, including ensuring that our habitat is sustainable over the long term. Now, what I'm suggesting here is that walking needs to be a fundamental lens or framework for thinking about our habitat, the urban places where we live. And in part, I'm suggesting this to this room filled with architects and planners and lawyers and industrial engineers because we, in fact, have designed walking out of our lives. We've, in fact, designed walking out of our communities. And this is one of the reasons why we need to become so conscious of designing walking back in, because we did it by mistake. We didn't know we were doing it. We didn't mean to do it. We truly didn't think there would be such negative consequences or implications, but we're living with those, comp those implications today. I want to suggest that we need to use data, evidence, and good practice to build capacity and understanding for how we can, in fact, live differently, how we can, in fact, embrace pedestrianism as a fundamental part of health, of sustainability, and of community building. Like all creatures, we, of course, live in a habitat. I believe that cities, when designed right, and when nurtured with care, have the capacity to be the natural environment in which we live. And that's really what a habitat is. It's the natural environment in which a creature or a species lives. I believe that cities, if we design them right, can in fact be our natural habitat. When we design them wrong, they're not our natural habitat, and as a result, we do not flourish. Now, we tend to, when thinking at the problems that we face in, in our region, for example, we tend to think that we need big infrastructure investments. We need to spend a lot of money to make the world a different place. Look at the big move, Metrolinx's big move, our regional transit plan, promising if we spend billions and billions of dollars our quality of life will go up. Why will our quality of life go up? Well, now you can live in Hamilton and work in Toronto, and you can get on a high-speed train and zip from Hamilton to Toronto. But let's face it, even on a really fast train, like a Tesla train, it's still going to take you at least 45 minutes, which means you're still going to be commuting an hour and a half a day. And an hour and a half a day is our average commute in this region. Why? Because we designed our communities for vast distances. We didn't design our communities to be directly related to our most natural habitat, which is the habitat of the walker. We didn't design our communities to be on the scale of the pedestrian. But when we do design our communities to be on the scale of a pedestrian, a very interesting thing is happening. We're seeing a tremendous amount of growth. Whereas, over the past 50 years, we have designed our communities to primarily be designed around vehicles, we're in fact seeing that the places where we hung on to that legacy of a grid and a main street pattern, and a grid matters because it provides the shortest distance between two points for a pedestrian, and anyone who walks anywhere knows pedestrians take the shortest distance between two points. You don't do a loop-de-loop -loop long trip when you're a pedestrian. You always go the shortest distance. Any playing field that has a great destination on either side will show you this because you can see the pedestrian pathways. People always walk the shortest distance between two points. And that's why our street grid matters so much because it gets us from one point to another. But as we moved away from the street, as we began planning our communities, 
without regard for the street as being a fundamental part of our habitat, we saw a whole bunch of things become disjointed. We, in fact, discovered that we needed to travel much longer distances. And we actually thought, well, this is great because I can live somewhere and I can work somewhere else. And this was very much the, the root of the Garden City concept because the Garden City concept, as introduced by Ebenezer Howard in 1903, was really the idea of cities with no center, that we would, in fact, live in these pods, and the pods would have industry, and the pods would have commerce, but the pods would be small, approximately 32,000 people in each pod, and each pod would be surrounded by a vast green belt. But the problem is, in trying to oversimplify and come up with a beautiful diagram, instead of embracing the complexity of the city, what, in fact, Ebenezer Howard created were completely unsustainable living habitats because 32,000 people, particularly in light of industrialization, was simply not a large enough pod to bring together the critical mass of uses that creates complete communities, environments where you can live, work, and play. This was a very important moment in planning history in, of course, it was, uh, and it was an important moment, in part because it was a fundamental change in how we thought about our cities as places where we live. Now, it was a response to what wasn't working in London, in English cities, in, in Paris, Le Corbe, he was responding to the slums in Paris, and the idea was people have come in too close, they have no light, they have no privacy, they have no access to air, so let's actually spread people out. And when we combine that with the rise of Fordism and the opportunity for each of us to own our personal vehicle, we started spreading, pe we started spreading uses out and placing buildings in such a way that they no longer had a relationship to the street. And they didn't have a relationship to the street because they didn't need to, because we weren't walking. Buildings need to line streets when pedestrians inhabit places. When pedestrians don't inhabit those places, when it's cars that inhabit those places, it doesn't matter where, in fact, the buildings are because you're just going to drive in, drive underground, and go up into the building anyway. The context doesn't really matter. So this was a really critical, it was a really critical point in our, in our history, and it was a transformative moment, uh, really in the 1930s, when uh, the Garden City movement really started to take root. So moving from that first radiant city idea of people living in pods was the Garden City movement, which was also about attempting to escape the noise and pollution of the city. And this was about introducing high-rise towers surrounded by green spaces. And this, of course, had a profound impact on the landscape of Toronto. And we know that uh, over 50% of our residents live in condos or in apartments. In our suburban parts of the city, uh, the previous um, Etobicoke, Scarborough, North York, North York, these parts of the city, in fact, have an image in the mind's eye of being bungalows, low-rise neighborhoods. But in fact, it was during the 50s and 60s that we built a tremendous number of towers in the park, these buildings that were an outcrop of this Garden City movement. And in a very short period of time, this notion of living in a tower, just simply a residential tower with green space around it, in a very short period of time, these communities, which were really built to be avant-garde places to live, became rather desolate and desperate places. And this happened for a very simple reason. There was no relationship to the street. People were living above the street and away from the street. The only way to get to these communities was, in fact, by car. When we don't have buildings that have a strong relationship to the street, it's very difficult to create great public transit because transit also needs streets. So these communities very quickly became isolated rather than exclusive. 
And many of the tower neighborhoods that we uh, have in the city today that are part of our tower renewal project. Uh, and how many people here in the room are, just throw your hand up in the air if you're familiar with tower renewal. So a good number of people. These are garden city towers. They're towers in a park. And what is so fundamentally wrong and problematic with these environments is that there's no relationship between the buildings and a street. And if there's no relationship between the buildings and the street, it's impossible to live as a pedestrian because there's nowhere to walk to. You can't walk to work. You really can't walk to visit a neighbor unless they're in the same building and you know where they are. You cannot walk to get your hair cut or, you, or walking out to dinner because the buildings and the environment are fundamentally disconnected from the urban fabric that makes and creates a walkable habitat. Now, today, this design of towers in the park is primarily vilified for reinforcing the separation of uses, primarily because they were single-use environments. We had residential over here in this part of the city, but you had to work over in this part of the city. This is a problem. This didn't work. But I would like to suggest that it was this disconnecting the built form from the street that is the bigger problem and the bigger challenge that we now need to overcome. And this, in fact, turned out to be a really dangerous idea, separating our buildings from streets. And it's a dangerous idea because at the same time that this was happened, happening, we were learning from the work of Jane Jacobs about the importance of things like eyes on the street. Well, when your building is isolated and isn't connected to a street, you don't have eyes on the park, you don't have eyes on the street. There needs to be a relationship between what's happening in a building and the environment around it. And the scale of the building will determine whether this is successful or not. But the relationship between the building and the spaces that people occupy as a part of their everyday life is also going to determine whether eyes on the street is going to be achieved or not. I had a very interesting um, experience earlier this week. I spoke to some grade eight students in Thorncliffe Park. And these uh, students, we were talking about planning and what planning is, and I asked the students in the room, I said, how many students here have been down to the waterfront? And only five students put up their hand. And after I was done the present teacher, presentation, the teacher came up to me and she said, these, parent, these students don't leave the neighborhood. They don't ever leave the neighborhood. The neighborhood is an isolated pod. It's disconnected from the rest of the city. But more importantly, she said to me, these students never leave their house. They never leave their apartment. They leave their apartment to go to school, and when they're done at school, they go back to their apartment. They're not a part of that urban landscape. And what's interesting about this is that I have a 13-year-old daughter. She's in grade 8. And it's interesting when your children get to an age where they're starting to kind of feel their way around the city and push their boundaries. So here I was in a room with children that were the same age as my child, and I was told by their teacher, these, these children, those children who raised their, their hands, those five, they went to the waterfront on a class trip. They never leave their neighborhood. They're completely isolated from the rest of the city. Well, my eight-year-old takes transit. She'll go visit a friend. She'll hop on the subway. She'll hop on the TTC. She will go shopping with her friends. She'll walk out, and yes, this is taking some very serious letting go on my part, but she will walk out to the main street. She'll walk out and buy bread for us for dinner or run other errands. We have a craft store not far from our house, and she frequently will walk out or walk you know, 20 minutes away to visit friends in another part of the neighborhood. The built form determines whether People, in fact, can inhabit their community as pedestrians. And we, in fact, by separating buildings from the street, 
created places that very quickly became undesirable places to live. Tower renewal is about fixing this. Tower renewal is about remediating those places. We've just introduced a new zone in the zoning bylaw called the RAC zone, the residential apartment commercial zone, to allow mixed use within these areas. But there are bigger challenges, including these areas need built form to be added that connects the existing buildings to the street network to provide continuity for pedestrians and to link in these communities with other communities that exist in the city. So this idea of severing, severing our streets and our buildings that really took root in the 50s and 60s in, in this city has done a tremendous amount of damage to our city as a pedestrian habitat. And the only way we're going to fix this damage is by being very intentional, intentional about creating environments where walking is a fundamental part of the city we live in. So what have we done with policy? I'm going to give you a little bit of an overview of some of the things that we've done with policy that have been about trying to both repair and enhance the urban fabric of the city to in fact be a place for pedestrians. In 1976, the City of Toronto adopted the Central Area Plan, which introduced for the very first time residential population targets for the downtown core. Now what's interesting about this is that this was pretty early. It was much later that most cities went, wait a minute, our downtowns should be environments for people and we need to figure out how to get people living in our downtown as a way of creating a vibrant place. What's interesting about this is that we are now reaping the rewards of emphasizing residential development within the core of our city. And in fact, 41% of the growth that happens in this city is in fact happening, the residential growth is happening right in the core, in those most walkable areas. Over the past five years in this city, we've uh, we've built 70,000 units, that's a lot of housing. Most of those units have been apartments, over 81% of them have been apartment units. Most of those have been in the core. There is a desire for us to have walkable habitats. There was a policy in that central area plan that very clearly enabled and facilitated the redevelopment of brownfield sites and parking lots in the downtown core in order to create the density and the critical mass to enliven and create the pedestrian district that we see today. The plan envisioned a pedestrian friendly core and put an emphasis on pedestrian, pedestrianism, but also introduced some very important policy directions in order to facilitate this direction, including commercial zones that were redesignated to be mixed use commercial residential areas. We also at that time allowed street related retail and service uses in new areas in the central core. So allowing for a finer grain of mixes in the downtown core. Despite all of this, uh, there were limited, and it was you know, a bit ahead of its time, there were limited urban design specifications that would in fact create real clarity with how you design a building in order to ensure that building is supporting the pedestrian environment. And I'm going to end by talking a little bit, I'm, going to, I'm kind of working down in terms of my level of detail, and I'm going to end by talking about some of the specific ways that buildings either enhance or detract from the pedestrian environment in a few minutes. So on the one hand, we were adding new development into the core of the city good, you need a critical mass of uses and people in order to create a pedestrian environment. And just as an example, think for a minute, when you go to a, a big city like uh, New York City, let's say, what do you pack in your bag? Comfortable walking shoes. And what do you do in New York City? You walk for like five hours straight and you don't think twice about it. Because you have a continuous urban environment that's breathtaking and interesting and engaging. Maybe some of it isn't breathtaking, but it's at least interesting. It piques your curiosity and makes you want to see more. You need that continuous urban fabric in order to inspire a truly, a truly pedestrian environment. Now imagine walking for five hours north in Toronto. 
when you do not have an interesting urban environment, when the urban fabric is hospitable to pedestrianism, you've got large parking lots or big wide corridors with narrow sidewalks, 20 minutes feels like a long time, let alone walking for an hour or two, which is something that you will do in a beautiful city with a continuous pedestrian environment without even thinking twice about it. You'll suddenly realize it's late, it's time for dinner, and you've just spent the entire day walking. This is the opportunity that we have in our city because we do have a wonderful grid system and we can build out our grid with mid-rise buildings that in fact create this strong pedestrian environment. So that was a little bit about the 70s and the 80s. So we were beginning to get residential development into the downtown but we weren't really regulating it very well so we were getting you know, some not so great buildings, but also some good stuff as well. And really the flagship project of great urbanism from this era, era is St. Lawrence neighborhood, a mid-rise community that was designed all about bringing the uses in close and bringing in a variety of housing tenures. There's affordable housing, there's co-ops, bringing the schools into a very urban format as well as the daycares right into the base of the mid-rise building. It still today is a best practice that has in fact stood the test of time. As a counterpoint, at that same time, Regent Park our most urban example of towers in the park was just continuing to slide into a uh, very, very troublesome decline. The built form really mattered. In, uh, in, in 91, a uh, city plan was introduced, and city plan, for the first time, introduced built form regulations. And this was the first time in the city where we started to say, you know what, if we really care about creating a great pedestrian environment, we need to actually put some regulations in place that respond to that objective. And by putting those regulations in place, we really began to initiate, in a substantive way, the discipline of urban design, of designing our buildings in such a way that they are oriented and considerate of how we create a great pedestrian environment. Amalgamation followed. After amalgamation, our new official plan, which is the official plan that we have today, put even more emphasis on built form and continuous streetscapes. And we've since sub supplemented that with a whole variety of different policy frameworks, including our tall building guidelines, our mid-rise guidelines, our urban design policies for specific areas that are all about recognizing the importance of the pedestrian as a fundamental part of urban life. And by default, the importance of planning and designing the public realm as an important part of city life. Now the challenge, of course, when you walk down our streets in these cities, and there's many places that might make you feel sad, is that we haven't in fact accompanied those policy frameworks with a significant amount of public investment. We've actually done a pretty good job when new projects come along and we have streetscape design guidelines that, are, uh, that specify how we prioritize the pedestrian by, ha by designing the sidewalk and the public realm around our new buildings. And we are in fact able, through the development review process, to ensure that new projects conform to those streetscape design guidelines. And this is one of the reasons why you see some of the, the best, I would argue, streetscape designing that happens in the city is in fact happening where we have new development. The parts of the city that require public investment We've got the policies in place, but we don't have the public investment. Those are the areas where we, in fact, see the most decline. Now, for those of you who are interested in seeing some of the most recent and good work that's been done in this area and looking very closely at how we design the pedestrian realm, I would point you to the work done by the Entertainment District, BIA, and the John Street Red Carpet which is all about designing a spectacular public street from Grange Park leading south to the CN Tower, to the Sky Dome, and transforming that corridor into a place that is a priority environment for pedestrians. So that's a little bit of an overview of why planning matters, a little bit about the policy context that we operate in, and I'd just like to leave you by walking through 
uh, what I've called insights, insights for creating a walkable city in city building. And these insights are directed at anyone who is involved in any kind of design of the urban environment. And I'm going to talk a bit about buildings and I'm going to talk a little bit about the way we design our streets. And the first insight that I'd like to share with you is that sometimes great walking environments that are the product of great planning have lousy architecture. And yet, they're great places. This is important to recognize and acknowledge. And it's important to recognize and acknowledge because a great building doesn't mean a great walking environment and it doesn't mean a great place. And uh, <clears throat> you can clap, clap loudly. Um, and I just want to, um, I want to send you on a field trip after this lecture. I'd like to send you on a field trip to a wonderful place in the city that has a very vibrant street life, and that is Bloor West Village. And Bloor West Village is a, a very interesting environment because you have some, uh, it is really bookended by two spectacular public spaces, great planning. You've got the Humber River Valley, you've got High Park, you have a subway line running underneath it, there's some higher density and mid-rise development beginning to emerge. And if you look at the streetscape of Bloor West Village, look at the architecture. Because the buildings really aren't that great. But the street works. And it works as a place. And it is a wonderful place. And it's a wonderful place because the planning is well done. It's because of those larger decisions about the uh, public space, the infrastructure, the, the small scale frontages that exist in those buildings that are nothing really to write home about, create a very strong sense of place and a wonderful walking environment. So that sort of leads me to my next statement. And I would not have the nerve to make this statement, so I'm going to quote someone else. <laughs> and it's this. And this is from James Cheng. Uh, many of you are probably familiar with his work in Vancouver. And he, of course, is the architect of the Shangri-La here in Toronto. And I was out in Vancouver a few weeks ago, and I toured a whole variety of his projects with him. And this is a quote from James Cheng. He says, architects who build cities must tame and manage their egos. It's not about you. I hate to say it. It's not about you. It's about the people who will occupy your buildings. It's about the people who will occupy the spaces around your buildings. That's your true legacy, is to create places where people are healthful and where people flourish, and where commerce flourishes, where innovation flourishes. Architects who tame and manage, architects who build cities tame and manage their egos. The third insight, in creating great cities, we need buildings that will last. Buildings that have longevity, and buildings that have longevity are buildings that are built with resilient materials and are buildings that are adaptable over time. Buildings that can transform. The embedded energy in a great building never goes away. This is an imperative part of building a sustainable city because so much of our waste is actually building material from architectural projects gone wrong or that are no longer needed. Build your buildings to last. Build your buildings to be adaptable. And think of 401 Richmond, which has been completely invigorated and has a whole new life from its industrial past. So that's insight number three. Insight number four is that the most important part of a building 
unless you're in the postcard business. If you're in the postcard business, you're off the hook on this one. But the most important part of your building is, in fact, what happens on the ground. It was what happens around the podium of the building. If you want to participate in city building as you design your buildings, you need to think very carefully about that ground plane. That's the part of your building that is experienced by pedestrians, but that's also the part of your building that will determine whether or not your building successfully contributes to the landscape of the city and creates pedestrian continuity. Because one of those reasons that New York work, wa works so well is because you can just keep walking and walking and walking, and a lot of the buildings are not that different, but there's a great continuous pedestrian environment. When there's big gaps in the streetscape, it's undesirable, and it doesn't become a strong pedestrian environment. And that really leads into my next point, my next insight number five, which is that some sites, by necessity, some sites in the city are background sites. They contribute to the continuity of the public realm. That's their main purpose. Every site isn't a superstar site. Sites that are not background sites are sites that are view terminus sites or sites that contribute to the streetscape in a unique way, possibly because of their setback and sometimes because of their use. But it's imperative to have clarity when working on city building as to what type of a site are you working with. Is this a background site or is this a signature site? And if we mistake those background sites and we think they don't matter, we do great damage to the pedestrian realm. And that really leads me to my next point. There's a logic here, which is that buildings that ignore their context are rude. I don't like rude children and I don't like rude buildings. Buildings have a civic obligation. It's a deep responsibility. Just think about it. The way we've planned our communities has affected our health. There's something very personal about that. We've planned our communities in such a way that we now have a new health problem, which is obesity. Our parents didn't. A generation ago, this wasn't a health issue, but it's a health issue today. And we need to design activity back in, and our buildings need to design our activity back in. That's an obligation that city builders, in fact, have. And as a result, insight number seven is that buildings must speak to the street. They must have a conversation with the street. It's imperative when you're walking by a building that you know what's going on in it. There needs to be windows and doors with a frequency that responds to the scale of a pedestrian. There's a reason why big box buildings have big blank walls. If, it, if you walked beside them, beside those walls, we would all complain about them, but we don't. They're not responding to the pedestrian. They're not creating a pedestrian environment. Detail doesn't really matter. If we care about creating walkable environments, Detail at eye level really matters. Seeing people going in and out of buildings on all sides really matters. And uh, here I'll, be, um, I'll take a little jab, but it's not an unfair one, which is that I actually think the new Four Seasons building is really rude. It's really rude to Bay Street. It's turned its back on Bay Street. It's not great for pedestrians. It kind of says, it's kind of hunkered down away from the city, maybe because it's so exclusive. We can't see what's going on in there. It's imperative that our podiums are open, that the base of our buildings tell us something about what's happening, and in the best case scenario, invite us in. This is important, an important part of an inclusive city where we feel safe. Mid-rise buildings tend to speak to the street the best.
They do a very good job of speaking to the street. Often, not always, it depends on how they're designed, but we have many mid-rise buildings in the city that do a wonderful job of speaking to the street. And frequency of entries is a very important part, as well as the amount of uh, glazing that you see on street level. And one of the ways, this is insight number eight, that buildings speak to the street is through their entrances. The way entrances are designed, entrances at street level are an imperative part of responding to the context in the environment, the view termini, special features in the landscape. Entrances are a very important part of ensuring that your building meets its civic obligations. Insight number nine is that pedestrians need sunlight. I actually thought this this morning as I was biking in, and I was noticing immediately whenever I was in a part of the street where there was only shade, and then I would be back into the sunlight, and then I got onto Bay Street, and I was completely in the shade, and I was freezing cold. And then I came to another point in the street, and I was hit by the sunlight again, and I was warm, and it was pleasurable again. The experience between being in the sunlight and not being in the sunlight in a winter city is profound. And we need to ensure we design our buildings to allow sunlight to hit the sidewalk for pedestrians. This is a fundamental part of designing a pedestrian city. Now, there's another part of that, and it is about awnings. Awnings, you might think, well, who really cares about awnings? Well, awnings really matter. Porticos were designed for a reason in rainy cities. In fact, awnings are a very important way of mitigating rain and wind. And mitigating rain and wind is an imperative part of creating a great pedestrian environment. You know the corners where there are no awnings and there's no podium and there's no step back and there's a tall building. And you know them because if you walk by them, you quickly decide to avoid them because the wind, of course, hits the building and is slammed down into the sidewalk and is a very pleasant, unpleasant environment for pedestrians. So awnings are a really important part of creating an environment, a climate, a microclimate at the street side that is, in fact, going to be pleasant for pedestrians. Uh, insight number 11 is that ambiguous public space will always feel abandoned and attract unwanted activities. This was the problem with towers in the park. There was too much kind of space that no one really knew what it was for. What are you supposed to do in that space? And it always amazes me the way those spaces are completely unoccupied. Like there isn't even someone throwing a frisbee in them. And it's because they really don't have anything to define them. And the more urban we become, and the more uh, clear we are in our pedestrian environment, the less tolerance we have for ambiguous spaces. It needs to be public or it needs to be private, and there needs to be clarity about who's taking care of it. Orphaned spaces are not good for pedestrian environments. They tend to fill with junk. They tend to fill with unwanted activity. So when thinking about a building, it's imperative to think about the spaces it creates and how those spaces become a meaningful part as the public realm instead of designing a building and treating the leftover spaces as the public realm. They need to be a fundamental part of the building design. Insight number 12 is that building placement, if you're creating a pedestrian environment, is really your most fundamental design decision. Where the building gets placed and how it is massed is going to be more important than many other considerations. Insight number 13 is that given the complexity of a city like Toronto with a variety of site widths, depths, and ownerships, uh, ownership arrangements, guidelines, as much as we want them to be very rigid, and this is a really interesting universe that I find myself in, because I talk to developers, and developers say to me, your guidelines are way, way too rigid. They need to be more flexible. Your staff apply them in a way that is way too rigid. And then I go talk to my counselors and my community residents, and do you know what they say? You're way too flexible with your guidelines. <laughs> you need to be more rigid with your guidelines. Your staff are way too flexible. So depending on where you sit, 
You have a very different perspective on how rigid the city is being with respect to the interpretation of its guidelines. But I would like to suggest that one of the challenges we have in a city like Toronto, where there's a tremendous amount of complexity, all these, you know, on our, on our avenues, in some instances, we have a lot of narrow lots, and they're shallow as well. And then we have some very, very deep lots with narrow frontages. It's very difficult to create guidelines for every one of those contexts and considerations. I tell you this because being committed to creating a pedestrian city means that you will approach those guidelines with a sensitivity to the intent. The objectives at the outset of the guidelines are a very important indicator of the kind of city that we're trying to create. And lastly, great city building that contributes to the design of the pedestrian realm that results in a great place to live is always a collaboration. It's always a collaboration. And in many ways, this goes back to my very first point about taming our egos. All of us, me too, taming my ego. It's always a collaboration. It's a collaboration between developers, between technical experts, between existing communities. It's always a collaboration. And the collaborations can lead to much better outcomes. Some of the best work we're doing in the city right now is in Regent Park. That is an incredible collaboration between students from this university, city planners at City Hall, Toronto Community Housing, the development industry, experts from a whole variety of policy fields, including housing policy. We're doing good work based on our collaborations. And the more we collaborate, and the more we recognize that our habitat is fundamentally a place for walking, the more we will thrive. Thank you very much. We have a microphone here and we always have a moment for a few questions. Not too many because there's only so much ice in the beer buckets and it'll have melted and it won't be as cold. Just kidding. <laughs> yes. What can Step you say me. about Liberty Village? Uh, I'll need another hour for that. Uh, I can say a lot about it. Um, you know, I, it's, it's kind of ironic because I just ended on this point about collaborations always, uh, collaborations can lead to a bet much better outcome. And Liberty Village is a really good example of some of the pushing and pulling that goes on in the context of our planning frameworks uh, with our political representatives and the development, development industry. And I think there's many good things about Liberty Village. One of the challenges that the planning department had is we, in fact, wanted to see in Liberty Village taller, slender buildings as opposed to the, 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 the shorter, uh, fatter buildings that you see. And then the reason that matters is because when you have a taller, slender, more slender building on a podium, you in fact uh, mitigate the shadows and you in fact create more sky view. And sky view is also very important for pedestrians as well. So Liberty Village is a, um, uh, uh, an outcome of a lot of pushing and pulling and it needs a lot of further consideration to continue to enhance it as a really strong pedestrian environment. One of the uh, challenges that we face in our planning policy frameworks and approach today is that we, um, we signal when there are community facilities or amenity issues in a given area when a project goes through development review, but signaling it does not necessarily lead to any kind of change. So for example, we know that we have a really congested 504 streetcar line on on, on uh, Queen Street, and yet um, we've been adding a significant amount of development, but there really hasn't been any kind of political interest in doing anything about, about that challenge. And the risk to us in city planning is that we continue to say, well, yes, we can approve this development, assuming that 
you know, we're going to see these changes in the community, and the development gets approved, but the changes never come forward. For example, adding new park space, it doesn't come forward, or the investment in transit doesn't come forward. We are actively working to try and address this challenge, and there's a few tools that we have in our toolkit that can help us with this, and one of them uh, is the development permit system. And I won't bore you with talking to you about what that is, but in just a few quick sentences, and you can Google development permit system, we're going to be bringing in a new approach to planning. We're making a recommendation in November to planning and growth management, where essentially you can combine zoning, site plan approval, and guidelines into a regulation that gives us in the planning department much more control over the development outcomes. And that will result in better communities, I believe, in the long run. Hi there. I, I agree with everything you said, uh, but why isn't it translating into the ground level zoning bylaws? And in particular, I'm talking about uh, you know pre World War II residential, um, you know mixed residential neighborhoods with main streets like those in East York. So in East York, there's this established main street on Woodbine Avenue. Nobody ever hears about it. Woodbine and Danforth. Uh, you know, great, the original urban fabric uh, meets all these criteria you're talking about. It's consistent, it meets the street, uh, it's fairly continuous. But the zoning bylaw, and also there's, there's very little parking, right? So there's no, there are no garages or anything like that in the original fabric. But the zoning bylaw requires that if someone wants to build a new structure, even on a site that has no parking, where everyone used to walk until now, they have to add a, uh, a garage, an attached garage, and that means that there, are, there aren't windows at the ground level on the street. That's required by the bylaw. Why are we not aggressively changing this in neighborhoods that are seeing very rapid transformation? Like, every second house in that neighborhood is being replaced. There are building applications coming in all the time. If we don't change it now, it will be too late. So are you talking about on individual properties the garage is required? On individual properties, uh, residential properties, garages yes. are required, a uh, or some form of parking uh, is required where there wasn't any previously. Why are we requiring that? Why is there why is there no build to line, which is an established mechanism? There sh there are minimum setbacks, but there are no maximum setbacks. Even though that's what planning tells us is much more important. So those are good questions. One of the challenges um, that the City of Toronto has had, and I walked into it, is that um, in amalgamation, we brought together uh, a whole variety of zoning bylaws and official plan policies, and it was this massive administrative task. So the new zoning bylaw that was just approved consolidated 42 zoning bylaws, and it took 10 years to do it. And the problem with the process is that it was a harmonization as opposed to a, a new zoning bylaw. And so there's lots of, there's actually lots of places like that in the city where we simply harmonized the existing zoning bylaw but didn't actually bring into place a new zoning bylaw that would be more in keeping with the objectives in the official plan. And that's going to be the next area where a significant amount of work is required. That being said, um, in many areas of the city, our avenues, our centers, our downtowns, we have secondary plans that do bring in a much more up-to-date policy framework. So part of what we're doing in the city planning division is we're trying to shift to being much more proactive and getting those proactive policies in place. We have about 80% of our resources in the, in the division go to processing applications. We process 4,000 applications a year. So every 30 minutes, we approve a project in this city. The problem with that is when a project comes forward and we approve it, we're reacting to it. And we need to be doing what you're suggesting, which is creating a, a, a more progressive policy framework. And uh, we need to create more progressive policy frameworks to ensure that when the applications come forward, they're going to be easier to process and more in keeping with the overall vision in the official plan. 
So there's a few things that we're doing to advance this very quickly. One of them is we're, we're reallocating the resources in the division in city planning to be more balanced so that we have 50-50. Uh, this is challenging to do. A slowdown would be great for me. Maybe not for the rest of the city, but a slowdown would be great for me. And, and we haven't seen a slowdown in terms of the applications that are coming in. So we, we need to shift our resources and reallocate them. And I just launched a strategic plan two weeks ago, and that's precisely what that strategic plan was about. It was about coming up with the strategies and mechanisms to be able to be more proactive to be creating updated policy frameworks. I um, would like to thank you very much. It's been provocative. I know we could be here asking questions till midnight, and then maybe then it'd be too late to walk home. I don't know. <laughs> Uh, so, you know, some of us have to get home for a certain amount of time, and, and if we want to walk, we're going to have to get out of here soon. But thanks so much for coming out, and um, we're going to have a little bit of a, you know, opportunity for you to mingle and have a snack and, and charge yourselves up with some energy before you take that long walk home. So uh, thanks again, and thanks, Jennifer. Thank you.